So, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's a real pleasure meeting a lot of you and, and seeing the campus, and so it's been a, it's really appreciated. So, uh, I'm aware that not everybody here does wet lab science, and so the approach that I want to take is interrupt me. So the goal is to keep everybody on the same page. So I don't want to oversimplify things, but I'll simplify them so that everybody uh, is getting the gist of what we're doing in the lab. And so the story that I'm going to tell you guys is in two parts. The first part of the story really centers on the idea of how N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids can affect the structure of a B cell, uh, particularly its plasma membrane structure and its biophysical organization. And that work led us into doing some functional studies. We started looking at how these fatty acids would affect the function of B cells, and then we had some very unexpected findings that took us into an entirely different realm of science, which ends up being obesity and influenza infection. So it was not something we were planning on doing, but just ended up that way. So a little bit of background on what I'll refer to as N3 PUFAs for N3 polyunsaturates or omega-3 fatty acids. These are fatty acids that are essential. Um, the majority of what you get is alpha linolenic acid, as shown at the top. And you get this from leafy green vegetables, walnuts, and things of that nature. And that particular fatty acid can then get elongated. So you can elongate this fatty acid to more long-chain polyunsaturates. And the two major ones that are of interest in my lab are these two, EPA and DHA, which are respectively eicosapentaenoic acid and eicosahexaenoic acid. Now, the, the, the efficiency of converting the fatty acid that's listed on the top from leafy green vegetables to more long-chain fatty acids is not very good. So as a result, the best way to get these fatty acids is through consumption of oily cold water fish. Uh, things like tuna, mackerel, salmon. Or you can consume them as supplements. Um, so uh, as I mentioned to several of you, the, the fish oil industry is very large. It's actually surpassed multivitamins. It's one of the largest industries out there for supplements. It's the number one leading uh, producer of supplements or, or in terms of sales. And the other possibility of getting these is, is prescription supplements. So these are FDA approved uh, for the treatment of elevated triglycerides. So there's a drug called Lavaza, a drug called Lacepa. Um, there's also a drug that's right now by AstraZeneca that's in, in the market, or soon to go to market, it's in phase three clinical trials. So the point being is that you can get these fatty acids in a variety of ways. So my lab's interested in, in these fatty acids from the perspective of deficiency. We know that in the Western population, the intake of these fatty acids is generally low when you take into account what the recommendations are for these fatty acids from major organizations such as the American Medical Association or ISFAL um, or the World Health Organization, so on and so forth. And so this map depicts total intake of just EPA and DHA coming from supplement or seafood sources. And what that shows is that the intake is on the order of about 100, 150 milligrams a day in the US. Now the recommendation by the American Heart Association is a gram per day above or above. Um, ISFAL recommends 500 milligrams in a day or above. And this varies depending on gender, sex, so on and so forth, so you know, uh, race. And, and there's a lot of variables, so whether you have car cardiovascular disease, what are your LDL levels, HDL levels, triglycerides, so on and so forth. But generally, it's well accepted, at least in the field, that our intake is low and needs to go up. So as a result of that, there's been a lot of feeding studies that have gone on for several decades now, really going back to the late 70s when this idea really started off in, in a series of seminal papers in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, where it was identified that Greenland Eskimos were consuming a lot of these, of these fatty acids and they had beneficial effects that really started off the studies and, trying to investigate how these fatty acids can affect physiology. So I've got a list here, uh, and by no means is this, this list comprehensive, but I just want to really drive home this, uh, a major point, which is that there's been a lot of studies in a lot of different areas, ranging from lots of work in cardiovascular disease, lots of work that's gone on with immunity inflammation, which I'll come back to, things like bone turnover, um, lots of work with cognition and, and development. So for example, uh, MarTech, which was, which was bought out by DSM, now makes um, supplements for, for uh, infants that contain DHA uh, in the formulas, and now that's actually a requirement that all infant formulas contain a certain level of DHA uh, in addition to other fatty acids. Um, there's a number of companies out there that make uh, formulations, for example, for burn victims that require certain amounts of omega-3. So there's been some very positive things that have come out of this, is that research has shown that increasing the levels of omega-3s in the general population can be beneficial. I'm not biased from the perspective that these things are necessarily good for you. Uh, my interest is predominantly trying to understand how do these fatty acids influence the immune system. And so we've been very much focused in on uh, a couple of things. Regulation of inflammation, so we've done a lot of work looking at inflammatory responses, and I'll show you guys data with that. We've also done a lot of work looking at uh, um, 
particularly the ability of, of how animals respond in terms of compromised immunity. So for example, a, a, an animal that is going to get infected with a particular type of bacteria virus, how does it respond when it has increased levels of omega-3s in circulation? And one thing that I think is very important to point out is that when we say there's potential benefits of N3 PUFA intake, that's really at the preclinical level. So if you compare to the clinical literature, there's a ton of clinical literature predominantly in the last five or 10 years that shows no efficacy, so null effects, or, or in some cases even negative effects of these fatty acids. In some cases, the studies were done poorly. In some cases, baselines were not measured. And in some cases, maybe there is no effect or there are some negative effects. So again, keep in mind that what we're doing at the animal level is very critical for us to translate to the human level because there's a big roadblock that exists between efficacy in animals and efficacy in humans. And so one of the things that we've been pushing really hard with the funding agencies and, and industry groups that, that, that my lab works with is that we've got to start designing better clinical studies. And, and part of that will entail uh, working with the right people and figuring out which population should we be going after. Now here's a, uh, uh, from Phil Collar's lab, this is a, a diagram that really represents what are the mechanisms by which these fatty acids affect immune function. So my lab initially started really what I like to think of as a bottom to top lab. We started off very mechanistic and we worked our way out of that. So we started asking some very basic questions which really centered on the idea of membrane composition. So when you consume or an animal consumes these fatty acids, which again predominantly are EPA and DHA in the form of fish oil, or you can get them in some other forms as well, like menhaden fish oil, tuna oil, krill oil, so on and so forth, and I'll come, come back to that later, it incorporates in the membranes of your cells. And almost 96% you know, of your cells in your body will take up these fatty acids very effectively and actually cause dramatic, we're talking two-fold, eight-fold, ten-fold, twelve-fold changes in EPA and DHA levels in the membranes of cells. So very, very large changes occur when you eat these fatty acids. And when they get in, there's a number of things that they can do. So they can change the composition of that given membrane. And that's going to affect things that are downstream in that cell of that membrane, which will be signaling events. Particularly, I'll talk about lipid rafts in more detail and, and what they are. And that will affect physiology. And so my lab, historically, when we started off in 2008, was focused on this very question is that if you give an animal N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids in the form of fish oil, what does it do to the membrane? And our line of thinking was the membrane is an important target because it controls so many things downstream in a given cell that's very important to understand the membrane. Now what you'll see is that that work took us in a different direction. And now when I go to part two of the study, you'll see that we're doing more about more work on receptors for N3 fatty acids and substrates for eicosanoids and, and resolvents and so on and so forth. So pretty clear on that. Any questions about that so far? Moving along, a little bit of background on the lipid raft model and cell signaling and why we're interested in this particular model and why do we study this. If you think about a cell's membrane, the best way I like to describe this, and I teach this to the biochemistry grad students a lot, is when you think about a membrane, most people think about just lipids there, right? But that's not really what it is. You have, you have hundreds and thousands of lipids that exist. So if you do a lipidomic analysis of one given membrane from one cell type in the body, you'll find roughly 1,500 lipid species that are found in a given membrane. And if you take that membrane and you think about it, how it works together to allow things to move and, and allow proteins to function, the best way to think about this is you have a piece of butter that's floating on top of olive oil. So you have a bunch of really fluid you know, lipids, and then you've got some really solid regions which are like butter. And those little pieces of butter I want you to think about as lipid rafts. These are regions of a cell that are highly packed tightly that are made up of saturated acyl chains and cholesterol. So what's depicted here is something that is part of a membrane that's the piece of butter. And that's something that exists on a nanoscale, very, very tiny. And that little piece of butter is floating around that olive oil, okay? Now why does that happen? The reason that happens is that it allows proteins to come inside that butter and generate signals. And when will those pieces of butter come together to bring all the proteins together for something to happen? Well, when there's a cell signaling event. So for example, a ligand, a hormone's gonna come bind its receptor or two cells are going to communicate with each other and need to facilitate transfer of materials from one cell to another to turn them on. That's when these events take place, and it would look like physically something like this. So now you've taken little pieces of butter, put them all together on the sea of olive oil, and now these proteins like to reside in this environment. And this is thought to be a major trigger for generating downstream cell signaling events. Now, this model is contentious. So I want to be transparent about this and not say that everybody buys this model. People in, in the membrane biophysics field buy this model, but there's many people who have come up with better models uh, of explaining this particular event. 
And when you think about classically the Singer-Nicholson model, which was a seminal 1972 science paper, that it's called the fluid mosaic model because that's the mosaic component. The mosaic is that piece of butter that's not mixed in with the olive oil. Okay? So that's, that's how I want you guys to think about this raft model. And so we decided to ask the question of what do these fatty acids do to the structure of these lipid rafts on the surface of B cells? And so why did we pick the study of B cells? And really it's a, a simple, simple answer to that. In the field, when I was finishing off my postdoc, there was not a single lab in the field of N N3 PUFAs that was studying B cells. Everybody was working on T cells. They were working helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, more recently TH17s, Tregs. No one was studying B cells. So we thought this would be a good niche for us to pursue studies in B cells and start asking questions. So a little bit of background on B cells so that we're all on the same page. Canonically, what do B cells do? Make antibody. And that can be normal antibodies or it can be pathological antibodies in select diseases. And those antibodies will then affect different downstream cascades that will then affect target tissues and ultimately human physiology. B cells can also present antigens. So part one of my talk is going to really focus in on this middle panel here, is how do B cells affect antigen presentation. So what do I mean by antigen presentation? B cell interacts with a T cell, transmit a, transmits a signal from the B cell to the T cell to facilitate turning on that T cell. That then makes cytokines and then affects target tissue, okay? So that was our central focus when we first started off. We also know that B cells can respond directly to innate stimuli. What I mean by that is that B cells can see pathogens or components of pathogens, such as the outer component of gram-negative bacteria, to generate cytokines directly. They don't have to interact with another cell type. The B cell itself can respond and make cytokines. So B cells have, and this is you know, just a very broad generalization, B cells do other things as well, but these are the three generalizations that we can think about what B cells will do in the context of an inflammatory or an immune response. Okay? So part one, and, and these are the basic questions that we were asking at the time. Number one, if we administer N3 PUFAs to animals, can we remodel the physical organization of these lipid rafts? Does something change about them that would be important for signaling? And the answer to that is yes, or I wouldn't be here. And so when we found that effect, the next question arose from this was, what does that do to cell signaling? So what happens for that ability of that B cell when its rafts are disrupted to now communicate with the T cell? And our approach has relied on something that I should point out from the very get-go is on, we've used a variety of different dosing and, and a variety of different types of fatty acids. The first data set in part one that I'll show you entails giving animals a control diet, which is a purified mouse chow, or we gave them a diet rich in menhaden fish oil. So this is three parts EPA to two parts DHA, and this was the form of fish oil that modeled roughly a human 150-pound male consuming four grams a day, which is what's prescribed by physicians for elevated triglycerides. So at that time, we were really modeling what a, a physician would prescribe to somebody that had dysregulated lipid metabolism. And so what you're looking at here is an experiment in which we took B cells that we isolated out from an animal fed the control diet. We did a couple of microscopy approaches. Right here is a confocal imaging approach. This is a total internal reflection microscopy approach. The, the advantage of this approach is, is we're looking at a top-down view of the cell. So we're looking at about 100 nanometers into the cell, so a very, very surface view of the plasma membrane. And these are what the lipid rafts look like. And these are fluorescently tagged. So there's a, an assay that we use to, to form these lipid raft domains, and we do this by forming them by using cholera toxin subunit B. If somebody's interested in that, we can talk later. But the point is it's a very standard assay to look at lipid rafts. We're modeling the idea that some cell, cell signaling events taking place. So what you see is some very distinct punctate regions of the cell which are enriched in saturated fatty acids and cholesterol, packed very, very tightly, and that's what we're imaging. So when we took the B cells out of the animals, fed the N3 proof enriched diet in the form of fish oil, look at what you get. Complete dissipation of those rafts. And that's a pretty dramatic change. So this was something that we did initially in, in C57 black 6 mice. We then went through this in a mouse on a 129 background. We did this even at lower doses, so we went down to the modeling two grams a day, consistently saw this effect, and since then many other labs have reproduced this in their cells. So the point is, is that the ability of these little pieces of butter to coalesce and, and generate a cell signaling event is diminished. And, and we see this at the level of, you know, from, a, from a, a microscopy approach. And we quantify this in a variety of different ways. Um, one way that we quantify this was just measuring the size of these regions of, of fluorescence. I'm not arguing that these rafts are necessarily becoming gigantic large rafts. I'm just arguing that their ability to cluster 
to generate signals is diminished, and that's the take home message from this slide. So we wanted to understand what was the mechanism. How did the administration of N3-PUFAS to animals lead to a change in this key signaling event that takes place that's pretty broad across the board that it takes place in a lot of different cell types? So we did some very crude biochemical studies in which we took lipid rafts and isolated them biochemically. Now, technically, these are, these are referred to as detergent-resistant membranes, but suffice it to say, it was a crude representation of rafts that you can isolate on a sucrose gradient through ultracentrifugation. So now what we're doing is we're taking out rafts from animals that are controlled diet or animals that are fed a fish oil enriched diet, and we're just looking at those rafts and looking at their composition. And when we did this, we did a lipidomic analysis. So we looked at all different types of phospholipids within these rafts and outside of these rafts using looking at different lipid species and trying to figure out where are the EPA and DHA that are found in fish oil going. And for the most part, none of these fatty acids were going inside the rafts. And that made sense to us because this is a polyunsaturated acyl chain with lots of double bonds. Lipid rafts are operation defined as saturated fatty acids and cholesterol. They didn't want to be in a raft environment. There was one notable exception to our, our, to our analysis, and that was this. What you're looking at here is phosphatidylcholine molecules inside of lipid rafts. And you're looking at the levels of EPA, it's a elongation product DPA or DHA within this lipid raft. And you're looking at it in response to either the control diet or the N3-proof enriched diet. And what we discovered was that DHA, in particular, was going inside these lipid rafts when it was incorporated or sterified to a phosphatidylcholine head group. So again, the take-home message is DHA goes inside a lipid raft. This was our big hit from this particular uh, shotgun approach. We wanted to confirm this, that this was real. And, and a lot of people have criticized this assay because it's, it, you know, it's, you're putting something on a, you're taking your cells, you're homogenizing them, you're putting on a, on a sucrose gradient, you're spinning them out. You know, what if there's some artifacts that are being introduced by that ultracentrifugation, so on and so forth. So then we did some NMR spectroscopy experiments. And when we did these experiments, we took synthetic vesicles of sphingolipids and cholesterol, and we mixed them with all different types of uh, phospholipids containing either EPA and DHA. And what we found was, in the case of phosphatidylcholines, Lots of DHA was going inside the raft. We could see, still see some, some small amount of EPA going inside the rafts. But again, the point is DHA and phosphatidylcholines was going inside rafts, and that's what we had seen with the animals. It's what we had seen now at the level of, at a very biophysical level with model membranes. So the next thing we did, wanted to know is if DHA goes inside a lipid raft to disrupt signaling, what does it do inside that raft? And that evidence came from a variety of approaches that's plotted here. Is we looked at cholesterol molecules, they're a key component of rafts. Cholesterol molecules can be isolated and they can be assayed in a variety of ways. So we did this biochemically and what we found was that within these lipid rafts, DHA, but not EPA, selectively displaced cholesterol from the raft out of that raft. So DHA went inside a raft, it saw a cholesterol molecule, it pushed it away. And how does that occur? So not work done by my lab, but some work that we contributed toward the study was uh, there's molecular dynamic simulations to show that if you look at a DHA so chain that goes inside a cell, Unlike most fatty acids, which are very straight, DHA can bend tremendously. It has tremendous flexibility. It's a very, very, you know, it's a structure that can move around a ton. And so what we discovered was both our lab and then several other labs confirmed this, was the idea that when DHA interacts with cholesterol, which is depicted here, it does it very unfavorably. It's sterically incompatible. And the reason for that is that this acyl chain here, this DHA molecule, Unlike EPA, DHA can move around so much that it pushes cholesterol away. And so when we had a sense of this, we wanted to go back to the animal model and confirm this. So we went back to the animal model. We fed animals a controlled diet, looked at rafts, and imaged them. We fed them an EPA-enriched diet, looked at the rafts, and we did DHA. So now we confirmed what we had seen mechanistically with our cell culture studies, with our artificial membrane studies, was the idea that if an animal is given a DHA-enriched diet, rafts are disrupted. If an EPA enriched diet is given, they're not. And I think that this by itself was an important contribution to the field. Broadly speaking, what we're trying to argue for here is that EPA and DHA are not equivalent molecules. And this is what we believe, and something we've been pushing very hard, is that is one of the reasons why we see so much discrepancy in the literature in clinical trials. So for example, if you look at meta-analyses for rheumatoid arthritis, one of the best described examples for inflammation where omega-3s have an effect, it's only 9 out of 14 studies that show efficacy of these fatty acids for lowering joint stiffness or, or swelling or pain, so on and so forth. And the reason for that is if you look across those 14 studies alone, 
Some people gave tuna oil, which was eight parts DHA to one part EPA. There were some people that gave menhaden oil. There were some people that gave EPA DHF esters. There were some people that gave krill oil, which is an entirely different composition. So one thing that we've been pushing for a lot, and, and is a big focus of the lab, is discriminating not just these two omega-3s, but discriminating these things from other omega-3s as well, like stereotonic acid, alpha linolenic acid, so on and so forth. And that's really based on this work to show that these fatty acids are structurally very, very different. So we proposed this model of lipid rafts. And the model of the raft was, is that you have saturated acyl chains and cholesterol that like to come together. And what DHA is doing is it's chopping it up into pieces, solubilizing it. So you have a raft, you're chopping that piece of butter into small pieces and spreading it out all over that olive oil. So when you image it above the diffraction limit of a microscope, you can see that it's all spread out in the plane of the bilayer. Okay? And this was driven by the ability of DHA to go inside, take that cholesterol molecule, push it out of the raft, and, and redistribute it. And we've got several other lines of evidence to support that model. The prediction of the model, which I think was really important to test, was what happens to proteins. So proteins that are sitting inside these rafts that require rafts to function properly, the prediction was that that would be disrupted. And so if you have a protein, I'll show you data with MHC class 2. If this particular protein likes to be inside a raft, it's, at least some of it is displaced. It can't end up in its right environment. So if that protein wants to end up sitting inside a piece of butter to generate signals, whatever that signal is, it can't do it because now it's been pushed into some of the olive oil. Okay? So that was the prediction of the model, and that's what we decided to test next. And in doing so, we use this model system. So this is our B cell, and we're now going to look at the ability of the B cell to signal to the T cell. So again, the B cells that we isolate are coming from either a mouse that's been fed a control diet or a mouse that's been fed a fish oil enriched diet, again, modeling roughly four grams a day for a 150-pound male. And we know that if you look at the machinery that's involved in the signaling events between the B and T cell, there's lots of different proteins that come into this process. There's lots of things that occur. And we couldn't look at all of them, but we looked at selective key ones that we thought were important. One was this protein known as MHC class 2 that requires rafts. It's what holds antigens there to present it to the T cell. So this protein will actually present a fragment from some given pathogen to this T cell. The T cell receptor recognizes this, generates downstream signals, and that leads to T cell proliferation, T cells making cytokines, so on and so forth. So what I'm going to show you is work that we did in which we looked at MHC class 2 clustering, and then we looked at different T cell responses. A key, 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 really important thing here is that the T cells are not diet modified. So these are coming from a, a transgenic mouse. So we're looking at the effects of fish oil on a B cell and how it affects a T cell that's not diet modified. So keep that in mind because that's important. And so this is what we got. So here is the B cell up here. This is mixed with our T cell control animal. You can see that these MHC class 2 molecules are localized to this interface between the B and the T cell, which is referred to as the immunological synapse. So that's the general region in which these two, where the B cell and the T cell make contact. When we gave the animals the N3 poof enriched diet in the form of fish oil, you can see that there's a pretty nice change there. And something I failed to mention earlier, when we do a lot of quantitative microscopy studies, the majority of these were all done blinded. So we don't want to, it's very easy to bias yourself when you're doing imaging studies. Um, and so what we did was, with our imaging, one graduate student would set up the studies, label them as, as number one, number two, whatever, hand them off to another graduate student who would go on and then do the imaging, not knowing which sample was which, and then we would unblind it once we didn't finish the analysis. And what we found was that if we quantified the intensity of the amount of MHC protein within this B and T cell interface relative to the rest of the B cell, you see that it goes down and actually some of these things are displaced. And this really fit the model well was the idea that if you've disrupted these rafts, now when we look at a signaling event that takes place in, in, in the human body or in a mouse, we know that in this particular case, the proteins cannot localize where they need to. And we also looked at some other parameters of this protein. So we did something that actually took us two years to get it to work, and still only gave us a p-value of 0.7, but I'll go to the <laughs> um, This was an accepted photo bleaching Fred experiment. So we're actually measuring the amount of protein on a nanometer scale. So we're looking at things at below 10 nanometers, how close they're sitting next to each other. And it supports the idea that when we give the animals into the PUFAs, they don't like to come close together. They're being spread apart. Just like we saw with the lipid rafts, the proteins are not ending up where they need to. They're being spread apart. Okay. Any questions on that so far? Hopefully it makes sense. Okay, so then we looked at the T cell side. We've shown now so far convincingly that the B cell is, is being disrupted by these N3 PUFAs. 
we looked at the T-cell receptor, a component of the T-cell receptor. We looked at the signaling molecule protein kinase C theta, or PKC theta. And when we looked at this, we found some very modest effects. We saw that PKC theta went down, there was no effect in the T-cell receptor. Now, we think that this may have been driven by the fact that the T-cells were not diet modified. And since then, uh, Rob Chapkin's lab at Texas A&M has shown pretty elegantly that if you give N3 proof as the T-cells, you see much bigger effects on the T-cells. So we're looking at the B-cell side. We're modifying the B-cell, but we're looking at the T-cell side. So the effects are modest. But even then, we see one signaling molecule going down. When we looked at secretion of IL-2, so this is a TH1 response, it goes down by about 40%. There's, it was a little bit noisy because our ratio B to T-cells varied across experiments. But for the most part, every experiment, we saw about a 30 40% change. So we were pretty convinced that this was real, that IL-2 secretion was going down. And other people have now reproduced this work, but where they fed the N3 proofers to the T cell side. So our guess is if you were to take the cumulative effect of what happens to the T cell, the B cell would probably be much larger. And that seems to be holding up for the most part. So this really uh, concludes part one of this talk, which is I think the biggest thing that we discovered from this was that EP and DH are not equivalent. And then we showed mechanistically how RAFs are disrupted, and since then, uh, this work has really morphed into a different area in my lab, so a lot of this work is now being done in mitochondrial membranes, and we're doing stuff with, with heart disease, and I'm not going to present any of that work. But the point is, is that we, we were able to show a mechanism by how DHA in particular disrupts the signaling regions of the membrane. It's done by going into these, into these rafts, displacing cholesterol, that causes a displacement of proteins. And we looked at other proteins as well, which I'm not showing you. So we looked at MHC class 1, for example, saw the same effect there. Um, and that leads to downstream effects on signaling. And again, I just showed you a couple of key select things like PKC data. What this work led us into was something that was not what we expected. We decided to ask a broader question here, which was if these fatty acids are, are disrupting this particular phenomena right here, which is what I've shown you so far, what does it do to the other functions of B cells? So we know B cells, their main role is producing antibody. We know B cells are involved in cytokine production in response to some pathogen. So we hypothesized at the time that if we suppress B cells' ability to present antigen to T cells, then presumably it'll suppress the ability of B cells to make antibody, it'll suppress the ability of B cells to make um, cytokine production. And this goes along well with the general paradigm of the field that these molecules are immunosuppressants or anti-inflammatories, right? We were wrong, is what I'm going to show you. Uh, and I refused to buy it in the beginning, which is, I was hard-headed about this. We, we saw, we started measuring, uh, in particular, uh, antibody production and cytokine secretion with a variety of different assays that I'm going to show you now. So the first experiment we did was we took B cells again from a control animal, an animal fed a diet enriched in fish oil, we purified them out, and we stimulated them with, with lipopolysaccharides. This is the outer component gram-negative bacteria, LPS. And so LPS targets this toll-like receptor 4 complex, which has actually been shown in the literature to be a lipid RAF-dependent process. So our line of thinking from the very get-go was, we've shown this that if you disrupt RAFs, it suppresses the function of B cells. If we are disrupting RAFs, these B cells, which we've shown convincingly, we're going to disrupt the ability of these proteins to come together. They're going to get spread apart. The signaling will be diminished. And these are the results that we got. So what you're looking at here is an ELISA assay, which we measured cytokine from these B cells. So we're stimulating these B cells with LPS, and we're looking at downstream cytokine secretion. So we didn't look at any signaling mechanisms in between. We're just looking at the functional endpoint of stimulating this B cell, which is to make cytokine. And when we first got this data, I remember telling the graduate student that had done it. I told her, I said, look, go back. It's got to be a problem with dosing, because we're seeing TNF-alpha being turned on, which is pro-inflammatory. We're seeing interferon gamma being turned on, which is pro-inflammatory. We're seeing IL-6 being turned on, which is generally pro-inflammatory. This can't be good. This has got to be wrong. And so, grudgingly, the grad student went back, set up a new batch of animals, reproduced it, and I still said, it's got to be the dose. <laughs> Four grams a day can't be good for a human. We, we'll go with that, okay? It can't be good. So then, she went back and did two grams a day, and she got the same result. And in the meantime, we were collaborating with some other labs who were doing this experiment in their mouse strains, and they got the same result. So at that point in time, I was like, crap, this sucks. My mom is <laughs> It's not holding up. And that's fine. It didn't hold up. But where it led us is, I think, what's more interesting, is that when we saw this effect, we decided to ask a question that really was driven by the funding agencies. So we decided to ask the question, would it be beneficial to turn on B cells? Remember, this is an ex vivo experiment. We've taken out B cells from an animal. We've stimulated them ex vivo, we've done nothing in vivo, would there be a situation in which turning on B cells inside an animal and ultimately human be beneficial? 
And so we decided to focus in on antibody production in diet-induced obesity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why we decided to go after a model of diet-induced obesity. This is work from Melinda Beck's lab, uh, with whom we've been doing some work with. She's done some studies in humans looking at the response to um, vaccination, antibody production response to vaccination. So she had a cohort of individuals that were given this trivalent uh, influenza vaccine. This is a group from 2009. And she measured one month and 12 months later their ability to make antibody against the different strains of influenza that was in this trivalent vaccine. And what's plotted here is the percentage of subjects that displayed more than a fourfold decrease in their ability to make antibody. Remember, antibody is being made by the B cells. And with all three different strains, it's pretty consistent. There's a pretty dramatic decrease in the ability of obese individuals, that's depicted in the black, to make antibody in response to vaccination, which is bad. Because we know that obese individuals, particularly in the surgical literature, there's a lot of correlations that show that post-surgery obese individuals are not responding well to vaccination. Um, or not responding, I'm sorry, to post-surgical infections. We also know in the vaccination literature, they're not responding well to vaccinations for the most part. And this even holds true in adolescents as well. So there's some studies, at least one or two, that suggest this, that obese children or, or uh, diabetics are not responding well. So this was one reason why we decided to pursue um, the idea that let's test this in an obesity model. And yes, it was a great leap of faith. There's no doubt about it. It was a huge jump for the lab and, and paid off ultimately. We've been doing some studies in our lab with a cohort of lean obese individuals as well. So what we've done is we've taken uh, individuals that have a BMI of 25 versus 35. These are age-matched males. And low numbers, we've only done um, it's, it's 11 lean individuals and 9 obese individuals thus far. And we've looked at the ability of the B cells to become activated again ex vivo. In this case, we're using some different antigens because human B cells do not respond to lipopolysaccharide. Uh, but they respond well to some other stimulations. In this case, it's targeting the B cell receptor and TLR9 uh, agonist is being used. But the point is, IL-6 goes down, TNF-alpha seems to be going down. And we're consistently seeing this with other antigens as well. So the point is, is that B cells are dysfunctional, and we know that if we can turn on cytokines with, with N3 PUFAs, this could potentially be beneficial. And again, this was one of those things where um, we decided to try it and see what happened, and as I'll show you, it, it worked modestly well. So our, our diet model, a little bit about the diet-induced obesity model that we're using. The, and I'll show you data from two different diet-induced obesity models. The first one is we gave animals a control diet, same diet that I showed you before with N3 PUFAs, except we've lowered our N3 PUFA doses to about 2.5 grams a day. And that's really because that's a more achievable dosage over the, over the counter in particular. A high-fat diet made of milk fat. So our high-fat diet is not your typical lard diet that people use in the field, which is generally 60% total kilocalories coming from lard. Uh, because we know humans aren't eating that much lard in their diet. So we've used milk fat, which we're still trying to work with our nutritionists that we work with on these diets to make them even better. And then we've done high fat plus N3 PUFAs, again, modeling about 2.5 grams a day for a 150 pound male. And if we look at glucose clearance as a measure of where are they metabolically, what we see is that those animals that are lean, whether they have control or N3 PUFA enriched diets, they don't clear glucose in response to a fasting glucose bolus. The high fat fit animals, are, are clearing glucose um, at a much lower rate, so their glucose levels are much higher later on. So in other words, these animals generally are glucose intolerant. They're not type 2 diabetics yet, so we've done some studies looking at fasting insulin levels, and they're elevated a little bit, but not dramatically. So these are animals on their way to becoming diabetic, but really modeling an individual that's obese and has diminished glucose clearance. One thing I want to point out about these studies is there's a tremendous amount of literature that is really split which argues that N3 PUFAs are good for diabetes, good for glucose clearance. At least in our hands, we don't see any of that. And so again, we've been touting that because again, these fatty acids are not good for everything. We injected the animals with TNP-LPS, so now we took our LPS, it's hapten conjugated, the hapten component shown um, over here. And we measured antibody in response to this hapten. So in other words, what we're doing is we're taking our outer component of gram-negative bacteria that's conjugated this molecule, we inject it into the animal after feeding these animals for 10 weeks, and we measured IgM levels. And what we found, what's depicted here in blue, is that animals that are consuming the lean N3 PUFA diet had elevated, modestly elevated levels of antibody. The high fat fed animals, as I showed you before with both the, with the human obesity studies, made less antibody. Addition of N3 PUFAs to this high fat fed animal rescued the effect. So this was a proof of concept. Uh, I don't buy into this too much and say that this means a tremendous amount for humans because this is an antigen that your human body does not see for the most part. And it's just a model antigen. But the point is, is it verified our general idea 
that can turn on B cells in vivo. Now, this was again contrary to what we had predicted and what we had hypothesized, but we decided to follow this and, and say, okay, if we can really turn on antibody production, let's take this a step further. Let's go to the next step and ask the question, where would this be relevant? And so we decided to ask the question, would EPA and DHA be able to generate more antibody in response to infection with influenza? This was a, a relevant antigen. So influenza is a major health burden in the human population worldwide. Um, and new therapeutic strategies are cl clearly needed considering the number of deaths that take place, particularly with the young and, and with the aging. So, and there's some evidence, again, with the obese folks as well. So we decided to ask the question, do these fatty acids have any utility in boosting antibody production in a model of influenza? So this has been our approach now. We've made some modifications, and this is our second diet-induced obesity model that we use. We feed animals four different diets. We feed them a controlled diet, which is our standard mouse chow. We feed them a high-fat diet, the same as what I showed you before, made of milk fat, 45% total kilocalories from fat. We feed them a diet now enriched in either EPA or DHA. Um, and now we're using EPA and DHA ethyl esters instead of fish oil. And the reason for that is we had somebody give us clinical-grade fatty acids, and since then we've now started purchasing these. But we think that using clinical-grade fatty acids is important because the fish oil field in general has some issues with it, is that fish oil composition is changing year to year. So as ocean temperatures, if you buy that model, as ocean temperatures are changing, um, as ocean temperatures change, we know that the algae that are, are uh, living are changing and their composition is changing. The fish eat the algae, which is the source of the omega-3s. And so we know that if you look at batches of fish oil year to year, especially in years of El Ninos, you find that there's dramatic changes in the content of EPA and DHA. And again, that could be one source of why the clinical trials aren't working, is that one year somebody fed, fed them menhaden fish oil, if you like, take that same batch of fish oil, or same company, and compare it two years later, it's not the same composition. So we've gone to a system in which we feed animals um, diets that are very pure in EPA and DHA ethylase, so we don't have to worry about that issue. Now, unfortunately, we lost all our EPA data because it got oxidized. Actually, we had some really cool findings with it. So we test all our stocks. Every single stock that we get in the lab, we do a lipid hydroperoxide measurement to make sure that we're not giving these animals peroxidized product because these fatty acid peroxide very quickly. So we're pretty robust about this. And these are all animals that have no peroxidized lipid. So it's very, very pure lipid they're getting. Um, if you look at, with echo MRI, the lean mass and fat mass of these animals, fat mass is going up with both sets of animals. Again, we see really no beneficial effects of the omega-3s and body weight gain. No change in lean mass. We've done some insulin glucose measurements as depicted as the HOMA IR index. So this is an index of um, fasting glucose multiplied by fasting insulin levels. And what we find is that both high-fat diet-fed animals, when they've been fed for 15 weeks, they're generally becoming glucose intolerant, and they're much closer to becoming diabetic. Okay, they're not diabetic yet. We still need to do some hyperglycemic, euglycemic clamp studies to confirm that. We infect the animals with influenza, and then post-influenza infection, we do the studies. So day zero, day three, day seven, post-infection is the data I'll show you. We've also done some studies going out to 21 and 35 days. So. We've been metabolically characterizing our animals because generally people in the field don't use these diets. And one of the odd things that we found with this particular diet is that if you look at the inflammatory profile, which is depicted here, cytokines, chemokines, that are typically measured in obesity from epididymal adipose tissue, inflammation goes up in the adipose dramatically. We're not seeing that with a high fat diet made of milk fat. So if you look at IL-1 beta, maybe slight elevation, but in all honesty, it's like eight animals, it's like one animal, it's an outlier. So, in all honesty, there's no change. IL-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, is actually going down with DHA, which is not good. TNF-alpha, pro-inflammatory, goes down with DHA. MCP-1 is something that recruits macrophages to generate inflammation in the adipose. That's going down with DHA, that's good. But the high-fat diet itself is not promoting inflammation or adipose. And so we've been doing a number of studies using OBOB genetic mice, we've been doing studies, and this has really become uh, uh, the postdocs project in the lab is that we're interested in figuring out, the idea at least is, that our high fat diets are moderate, coming from sources like butter, cheese, things like that, that are milk based, are they really so bad for you? And you know, if you talk to Joe Hibble at the NIH, he'll tell you adamantly that milk fat's great for you, it's not bad for you at all. So there's some need to understanding how do, and in our case the endpoint is B cells, we're interested in understanding how does fat composition affect a couple of endpoints of inflammation? And this really contradicts the field when we hope to publish this, we're hoping to make a splash out of it because it's going to piss a lot of people off. Um, but at the same time, it's an important conclusion because the diets that we're giving to humans, are trying to model humans as lard-based, 
We can reproduce that, so it's not our technique. So we've gone back and done that, of course, to make sure in our hands we can reproduce that. But when we do it with milk fat, we don't see any bad effects there, at least with inflammation as an endpoint. Okay. So here's the key data. We measured the amount of antibody being made in these animals. And so this is a hemagglutination inhibition titer, pretty standard thing that the CDC uses. And what we're looking at so far day zero, we just completed day three last week, there's no effect. In fact, no antidetectable antibody. Day seven is the first day to detect the antibody. The abuse animals make less antibody by influenza infection. That's actually been published. That's in the literature. Look at what the DHA does. So this is what we're really excited by now, is that the DHA enriched diet is turning on antibody production in these animals. So this all started off with us with rafts and with B cells, and we were thinking of the immunosuppressive effects. But what we really discovered is that at least with B cell cytokine production, ex vivo, and now with antibody production, and what I think is a very relevant model where we're giving animals high fat diets that are relevant, we're seeing DHA um, boost antibody production. The other bizarre thing is that we've observed is that if you plot the number of mice that even make antibody, there's a fraction of our obese animals that make no antibody. So they have, so it's not, even though these are genetically identical animals, there's some fraction of these animals that are just completely unresponsive. So clearly this milk fat based diet does have some negative effects, we just don't see it with inflammation, but clearly these animals are unresponsive um, as they start to get gain more and more weight, and that doesn't happen when we put two and a half grams, the equivalent of two and a half grams of DHA in there. So what's the mechanism? And this is our current line of thinking right now. If you eat DHA or a mouse eats DHA, it goes in the body, and what happens to that DHA? Well, one possibility is that DHA can bind a receptor. And there was a cell paper that showed that receptor is GPR120. We're exploring that. We're doing a lot of studies with GPR120 trying to figure out, is DHA going after GPR120? So far, what our evidence shows is that's not the case. But we haven't done yet. The other possibility is that DHA is being converted into what's known as specialized pro-resolving lipid mediators. Very, very hot topic. If you do a, a PubMed search on the specialized pro-resolving mediators, you'll find Nature, Cell, MboJ, those kinds of papers routinely every month. It's, it's something that's really uh, caught on. And what are these molecules? These molecules are depicted on the right coming from DHA. So DHA can serve as a substrate for lipooxygenase enzymes. And when it binds that lipooxygenase, it gets hydroxylated. So what you'll see here is that this DHA now has a hydroxyl molecule attached here. And these molecules are respectively 14 and 17 HDHA. Hydroxylated DHA at the carbon 14 position or 17 position, respectively. And then it can undergo further enzymatic modification to generate things like maricin-1 to protect D1 resolving DHA. And these molecules, we think, is the mechanism by which DHA is turning on antibody production. So we think that it targets these receptors, it turns on genes, turns on the proliferation of these B cells, these B cells proliferate, and now we've got an improved outcome in terms of antibody, infect, uh, antibody responses upon infection. So we've been trying to follow through on this. If we go in and independently inject these molecules into these animals that I've shown you, some are not depicted here, but the majority of them, in a vaccination model, so this is the 2009 H1N1 vaccine model. What you're looking at here is the vaccine alone produces some antibody. Look what happens when we inject these molecules in there. Independent of any diet, antibody levels really go up. So this is telling us something that these molecules clearly are capable of turning on antibody production, presumably by targeting the B cells. And so our line of thinking right now is really focused, at least for the next year, or next six months, on pursuing this particular mechanism. And we started looking at the B cells. So one thing that we've discovered immediately is if you purify B cells out of the spleen seven days post-infection where we see this nice change, we see the number of B cells is elevated. So this at least supports our idea that B cell proliferation is going up. And so we started characterizing these B cells. And I won't bore you with all the details. Suffice it to say, we've looked at all different populations of B cells with flow cytometry, whether they're really rare populations or larger populations like transitional one, transitional two, pre-marginal zone, follicular, so on and so forth. All the B cell populations we've looked at are all being turned on. So now what we're trying to really figure out is, 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 it, is the mechanism that when the animal consumes DHA, it goes and affects the development of B cells in the bone marrow, which is where they come from, and does that influence the number of B cells that come out of the circulation, and are these cells in just making more antibody because we have more of them? That's our current line of thinking about the mechanism by what by which these, by which DHA in particular is exerting its effects. We've started looking at some of these molecules. These are very, very difficult to detect uh, in circulation as well as in tissues. So we've been doing some mass spec analyses. And what we find is that 
Contrary to what we'd expected, at day seven post-infection, which is depicted here in red, we look at this molecule resolving E1, downstream product of DHA, it actually goes down. So that indicates to us that this molecule has been metabolized. So this molecule is clearly involved in the process of infection. And there was a, a, a cell paper that came out that showed that with infection, resolving e ones go up, levels go up, and we've been able to reproduce that to a T. But when we give the DHA in the diet, which they didn't test, it's going down. So we think there's some flux. We think that some of these molecules are being shunted to other pathways. And so what we plan on doing is some fluxomics to figure that out uh, long term to figure out when you give this molecule to an animal, where does it go? And this is, if you look at Journal Lipid Research this past month, this was one of the, the highlighted editorials was there's a lot of debate in the field. You know, it's unknown whether eating these, small, these fatty acids in the diet in humans, and there's human studies that are going on right now, but it really leads to generation of these molecules. It's a pretty controversial field. Some people buy it, some don't. And a lot of that's rooted in, in, the, in the methodology and, and lipidomics. Just getting a sense of time. Okay, I'm getting close. So, if you want to go to sleep, go ahead. Um, we, looked, we looked in the lungs. So, this is a respiratory infection. So, we, we'd hope to see changes in the lungs. When we look for antibody production in the lungs, this is bronchiolar lavage fluid that we pulled out. Neither high fat diet had any effect. Uh, in fact, if anything, is starting to go down, so there's less antibody in the lungs. But we do see the same trend here. A certain fraction of the high fat fed animals are not making antibody even in the lung tissue. What's been more interesting and surprising to us is that seven days post infection, if we measure with QRT PCR the amount of transcripts, so amount of viral transcripts that are in the lungs of influenza, which in this case is a mouse adapted strain known as PRA, there's less virus in the lungs at seven days with the DHA. And when we look at the profile, the cytokine profile, that drives a lot of this, what we're finding is that interferon beta IL-10, which are antiviral cytokines, are going down with the high fat diet. They're being rescued to some effect with the DHA enriched diet. And if you look at some of the, the more anti-inflammatory ones, both, both high fat diets are TNF alpha, IL-6 is going down. So the take home message is, DHA somehow seems to be lowering the amount of virus in the lungs. And not only is it lowering the amount of virus in the lungs, it's having some beneficial effects on the antiviral cytokines. What are the mechanisms that's driving that? Exact same line of thinking. We think that the DHA is generating these pro-resolving lipid mediators that then is affecting lung tissue. Now, where in the lung tissue, we don't know, and that's, that's our long-term plans to figure that out. But same receptor, same idea as what we're going after. And we just completed this analysis that's been really exciting for us is that what we find is that when we do a lipidomic analysis, uh, in our hands we've been able to detect this, this molecule and this molecule are both going up. So we're able to see these molecules going up. This is uh, the right lobe of lung tissue from animals infected seven days post-infection after these animals were fed for 15 weeks. And even some of these molecules are going up in the tissue as well. Now we, we've normalized this to the amount of milligrams of tissue. We don't know the absolute value of these things. But the point is, is that it's supporting this mechanism that we're going after. And if we go in cell culture and actually treat cells that are infected with virus with one of these molecules, in this case resolve in D1, we can rep reproduce this inside uh, cell culture. So in vitro, we treat MDCK cells with influenza. We measure the ability of influenza to replicate uh, with these cells, and we measure their growth. We see that within 12 hours, there's changes. But the point is, is that viral replication is lowered. It's not dose-dependent, but it's lowered to resolve in D1. So now we're going back and testing all these other molecules as well. But it holds up with our animal data is that these things are able to suppress viral replication in the lungs, which is why we think these animals are doing better. We've also looked at pro-inflammatory mediators. Generally, they seem to be going down, again, in the lung tissue. So it supports what we measured at the mRNA level. Now we're measuring this at the level of specific molecules, and we're finding it all adds up. So some of these things require some more ends, so this is work that's still in process, but the point is, is that we're seeing some suppression, suppression of some of these arachidonic acid derived mediators. Last data slide. What does this all mean? And I think this is what's really relevant and what really matters, is looking at survival of these animals. So what we're looking at here is percent weight loss, which is recovery. Clearly the animals that get infected with the control diet depicted in black, they lose weight, they start to come back up. So by, by day 15, day 21, their weights have come back up to where they were during the infection. What you'll see is that DHA models very much, in fact, some of them even improves, but really just is identical to the lean diet. High fat diet continues to go down. And so this is a study that's still ongoing, but we've put through, I think, 20, 25 animals through these studies, so, so we feel like it's pretty robust, is that there's clearly a difference between the DHA enriched diet and the high fat diet. The inclusion of DHA is improving the ability of these animals to 
recover. And whenever we present this data to virologists, that's always the question they want to know is who cares about all the mechanisms if there's no improvement in their ability to survive? And so we see some evidence for this, and at least statistically it's holding up. We'll have that study done in about a week or two where we've got animals going. So with that, I'll conclude and just show you, summarize what I've shown you so far. Um, one, we were able to demonstrate that when we looked at B cell activation with fish oil, we could turn on B cells. Not sure what that meant, but we decided to pursue it further. We looked at antibody production. We went to uh, an animal model of influenza. We showed that, indeed, DHA in particular turns on antibody production. It's turning on the frequency of B cells. It's turning, uh, causing some changes in the molecules that are made from DHA enzymatically. So that's the mechanism we're pursuing. Now, while we're doing this study, we've been doing a study in humans as well. So we just started this clinical study about a week ago, where we have human patients coming in that are obese males that we're now giving omega-3 supplements to. And we're trying to see, if, at least exactly as we did it with the animals several years ago, is can we turn on B cells ex vivo? And are the mechanisms the same way? So we're saving blood for lipidomics we plan on doing about a year from now. And the idea is that you know, we rapidly freeze this blood down, and we want to do the, the, the mass spec lipidomics and see, are the mechanisms going to hold up? And really, will this hold up in the human population? If it doesn't, maybe it's time to change careers. I don't know. But we'll see. I mean, it's, it's, if it doesn't hold up, it's an important conclusion then that what we're seeing in animals doesn't hold up, at least at the level of B cell activation, not antibody production, because we're not testing that yet. So, quick conclusion on, on acknowledgments. Um, the bulk of the work that I've shown you on, on um, RAS was done by Drew Rocket, um, who's now hired out of the industry and is doing well. Heather is now a postdoc at the NIH. She did a lot of the influenza stuff in the beginning, and that's been taken over by the, the lab that's currently in place. Um, the data I showed you with those mediators that were being injected in, in the flu model, or in the vaccination model, was done by Eric Carlson at St. Jude, who's coming to visit us on Monday and, and training us on that, and then sources of funding. With that, I'd be happy to take questions. So we have time, a little bit of time for questions. With the N6 proof? With the N6, and they DHA clearly displaced the N6 proof. So. We have. Uh, we've done some you know, simple studies just measuring levels, total levels from cells as well as tissues. They're clearly going down. So the DHA is coming in, in fact, particularly at the expense of arachidonic acid. So we've looked at even arachidonic acid derived mediators down, seeing like PGE2 goes down. So there's definitely, it, it occurs at the expense of the quote unquote pro inflammatory arachidonic acid. In fact, we've seen that in any of our studies, even the RAF studies I showed you at the beginning, studied the exact same thing. Other questions? So, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Craig. Going, going through back to the beginning with the B cell work and the, and the RAF issue, is there a, a much of a difference between different populations of B cells as the amount of, of, of lipid graph? Essentially, the amount of cholesterol that's been incorporated into that, and, and could that amount of cholesterol be, for example, in a in a whole animal or in a human population, be influenced by a cumulative dietary effect? So, in other words, you, you're seeing the disruption with with the, with the, the, the fatty acid, but but does the Cholesterol content that you start with play a big role in that? Do you think that might have a big effect? Absolutely. We haven't done this experiment um, looking at this phenomena. There's a journal of immunology paper that did it really elegantly in T cells, they did it with, with human subjects, where they showed that if you took T cells from people who had naive T cells as opposed to ones that were activated, there were dramatic differences in how packed, presumably how much RAS would be formed. And then they made the argument that the amount of cholesterol between these two cell types was different. Now, does the diet influence it? Uh, I don't think anybody's ever tested it on rafts with cholesterol levels in either animals or humans, but work that we've done at the level of artificial memories using liposome models, clearly if we change the amount of cholesterol, there's a big effect. And this is actually work that we haven't published yet to show that if you start adding more and more cholesterol in this, the effect of the PUFA actually changes. And so if you vary the amount of cholesterol, and we've done pretty broad strokes, like say 10% cholesterol versus 33% cholesterol versus 60% cholesterol, the effects in the rafts do change because the amount of raft that you form changes. So if you, there's a sweet spot for those rafts to form. It's not that, you, if you lower cholesterol, say when we've done the studies of 10, 15 more percent, we lose the effects of the PUFAs, which supports our idea of how they're working, 
because there's not enough cholesterol to form a raft. If you add too much cholesterol, the membrane doesn't even form a solid membrane, and then we've got problems there. So again, the proof has less of an effect. So it has not, it would be an interesting study to do it as a dietary intervention and then tease apart all the different B cell subsets and look at rafts and how the N3 proof is affected, but it has not been done in that respect. I guess I just look at it from the, from the sense that the rafts are formed for a reason. The signaling in many cases is dependent on that association and the proximity within, within the raft for the very proteins that are, that are kind of floating around in there. And so the whole thing can go in both directions. You know, do you start out with too much or too little cholesterol? And then what happens if you, if you push it the other direction? I'll write a grant when I go back to the lab on this. <laughs> I, I like that idea. I mean, it's something that we just haven't pursued because we've never really modulated cholesterol levels in our diets. Um, but it certainly is a study that, I guess the first thing we have to verify is that the amount of cholesterol we give in the diet, how much incorporation do we actually get into the B cell? And is it, you know, there's so many different subsets of B cells, is it one subset that it gets into? But it would be an interesting study. This is a real broad question in terms of translation. We were brainstorming yesterday about just um, facilities we have here, clinical populations, cohorts and things. Um, what would be a couple next steps in human populations that would fascinate you? I realize that's a very broad question. We've already started some of that. I mean, we're broadly looking at these subjects, but what we want to do is stratify them. So what we want to do is, is take uh, obese subjects and look at their fatty acid desaturase profiles, because those are the key key enzymes are involved in taking the short chain omega-3s to the long chains. And we know that uh, in the epi literature it's been shown that if you look at different populations, so Ski Chilton did this work where he looked at people that um, were in, I'm not sure if it was, I think it was Tanzania compared to a cohort in Boston and then a cohort down in Winston Steel, North Carolina where he's located. And if you look at the fatty acid desaturase profiles, they're vastly different. And so the idea is that how they metabolize the omega-3s is going to be vastly different. So we want to pick a cohort of individuals that are going to be not effective at even converting some of the more short-chain omega-3s to longer chain, going after that population, giving them the omega-3s, and seeing if they're more responsive to a population that has more fatty acid desaturases that are more effective. And the other possibility is repeating that same experiment doing it with the dietary interventions, having a low and high omega-3 intake, and compare that. So that would be the next steps. Sound like two great R01s, or at least one. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lisa? Um, so in this, in the mouse study, you're feeding the omega threes prior to your infection. So we keep the animals on the diet with okay. omega threes. So in a, a human obese model, would you propose that people who are obese be on levels at all times? Because won't you artificially be increasing their B cell response even when they don't need it? Great question, and certainly something that we've started looking into. So I think those cohorts of individuals that are, are showing diminished, and if you look at the immediate population, not all of them are bad at vaccination. It seems to be there's a certain cohort of them that's bad. And this is just what I'm hearing from other people not working my own. So that particular population, presumably, we think, would be put on an omega-3 supplement panned out in humans for a short range. And we know from bioavailability studies that giving omega-3s for, say, three to four weeks starts to raise levels in, in lymphocytes. No one's looked at B cells, particularly with B and T cells combined. Um, but if you take it out to about three months is where you see stable baselines. And so we would put them on, on the diet for three months, and then they would go get their vaccination shot, for example, maintain them for some time, and then take them off, or maintain them for a while. Will it be negative for other populations? Absolutely. The best example is lupus. So we know B10 cells and lupus transitional 1B cells are elevated in lupus. If omega-3s in humans are turning on those cells, that's not going to be good for those patients. So that's something that we ultimately need to address and are trying to address it now at the animal level. So my question has to do more with the technicality of your model. If you can go back a few slides. Sure. So you're looking at... Toward um, the end? Toward the end, yes, please. Toward the end, you're looking at um, the responses to influenza at a relatively... Um, the time of infection, so relatively early time points. If you go to the, your last slide that you had, you were looking at the, um, uh, what happens with their body weights after infection. Yeah. So 15 days out. So, and, and from, from a human perspective, a lot of us are exposed to all kinds of um, pathogens, and 
Um, most, in the case of influenza, we're naive and we get infected and we, we have a problem with clearing the, the organism. Um, have you looked at time points further on out where you get a more robust um, B cell response that's part of the memory response that happens? So you may have seen something like this initially. You, you, you clear it, it might be delayed because of uh, obesity in this case, but what happens <coughs> later on? Is there a, um, in other words, are people not compensating as well because of obesity? And, and in this case, would you see a more robust effect of your DHA, your diet to your DHA intervention? Yes, yeah, so we haven't looked at the memory response at all, and we're well aware we need to do that experiment. That's going to be the next follow up paper once we get this out. Um, we are doing some studies right now that are day 21, day 30 in that range. So if you look at Melinda's work, she's shown at day 21, in fact, antibody levels are identical. Day 35, obesity levels don't make any antibody at all. Um, so we're doing some of those time points, really based on her suggestion as well. But moving forward to uh, uh, a memory model, I think what a lot of the approaches are using dual infection models. We come in with the virus, come in with a second virus, and we plan on doing that. So there's a, a new grad student in the lab that will definitely be pursuing as her project. Um, there's also some talk of, of influence of autophagy in D-cells that may influence the memory D-cell response. So that's something else we're interested in looking at. Is it, is, are there changes in autophagy that will affect the memory D-cell response with these diets? But that's you know, stuff in the next year or two to come. So can you go back to your cytokine? Sure. The adipocytokine or the? Um, you know, where are, you, are you measuring them in the B cells or in the adipose tissue? Um, what, are you talking about the mediators, the lipid mediators? Yeah, after, after um, what's it? This is lungs. Okay. Lungs, okay. The, lungs. the stuff with the adipose was, And you've done the, the similar experiment in lungs with a, a, a depression. Exact same time point. Okay, day seven. So that's why I was saying in the lungs we see some, some negative effects of the high fat diet. We don't see any adipose. And we ordered a couple of OB mice just like looked at TNF alpha to verify that it wasn't our technique. And we saw robust TNF alpha and, and the OB OB mice fairly lean control. So I, we're pretty sure that's not our assay that's doing it. All right. And it's the timing of these that's critical in this you know progression. So you need a response that's appropriate and not too robust. And then in, in, in um, on the Beck's lab, it was a delay in the response. First, it was too low, and then they, when they finally responded, they, they compensated. The compensation was a too robust. It was an overcompensation. And that led to perhaps a cytokine storm and death as a consequence of an overreaction to the influenza mm -hmm. infection. We, you know, one of the things with the PR8 model is that it's a highly mouse-adapted strain. So what we're wanting to do is, is pursue some of these issues with, with the memory response and looking at the timing going into this flu vaccination that we're starting. So we're trying to get away from PRA a little bit and, and pursue a vaccination post where we'll vaccinate the animals, measure the response with time, then come back in with the virus. So the idea that will this be beneficial for individuals that are undergoing vaccination? Because that's where we see, at least with, with obese but not type 2 diabetics, with obese individuals you see that data that I showed from Linda's lab where a year later they're not clearing it very well. Right. So that's, that's sort of our focus right now in terms of a model system. Great, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Well, thanks for the feedback. Right. Appreciate it.